I'm here today with Dean Lamb of Arch Spire. You guys can't see me, but you can see him. I'm a little bit like John Cena today. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're in Toronto. Arch Spire is touring across North America right now, headlining tour. Uh, with a border to Carcosa and Alluvial, an incredible package oh, yeah. that is kind of just taking the first early steps. You guys have played maybe like six or seven shows, give or take, something al along those lines. I believe. Yeah, we keep looking at our tour passes and go, oh, there's only a couple more shows. Oh my God, there's so many more shows <laughs> left. We're like right around there, if you can see that. And then you can see all the other shows we have left. Yeah, so I think, I think this is show number eight. Or show number nine, something like that. Oh, I wasn't that far off. I said yeah. seven, so I wasn't, like that. I, I wasn't yeah. that far off. Yeah. But it's been pretty much Canada. I know, I know you guys played a, a couple of U.S. shows, but on this first part of the tour, it's been a lot of Canadian dates. Yes. So, so how has it been it for you guys uh, playing all of these Canadian dates, uh, starting off in the prairies, moving now into Ontario? We have like a really long history of playing those dates in Canada, like. Uh, those markets, so like Edmonton, Calgary, we played a million times. Uh, some of the first times we ever played outside of Vancouver were in Edmonton and Calgary. So it's really nice to see the crowds growing because there's a, I mean, I've talked about this a lot, uh, but the first time we played Edmonton, we played to one person. And then after the show, he was like, hey, man, that's, that's a great show. Like, can you buy me a beer? So it's <laughs> like, it's, a, it's like really cool to see that kind of grow, which is nice. Um, the, uh, the shows here in Toronto and Montreal are also amazing. The first show that we played in Toronto as a band was actually a really fortuitous show. Uh, the label that we were working with for the last 10 years, 10 years or more now, uh, there, was, um, there was promotion for the, the Toronto show. This is 2010 or whatever. And uh, the promotion for that Toronto show just so happened to uh, lead somehow to the, the, the guy that runs the US office of Season of Mist. And that's how we got signed to that label. So it's like Toronto, we have like a history of all these, these markets, these awesome Canadian markets. And I think a lot of it is being a Canadian band, people really find that sort of like uh, kinmanship with, with you, you know? And, and we love the fact that we're Canadian and we, you know, I mean, doing a Canadian tour would be awesome. I just, it's just so big. So I, was, I was going to ask you, is it even doable? Because it's there so are big. markets, but they're so far apart from one another. Yeah, yeah. You'll end up playing... Um, You'll end up playing shows and then having two days off at some point. There's going to be a two-day break where you have to go from Thunder Bay to Ottawa or some, something, something like that, where you just have to, you have to go, there's like a big gap between uh, Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay is kind of a tough one, too. I think we did Ottawa to uh, Edmonton in two days one time uh, in 2014, and we were on tour with the Faceless, Rings of Saturn, Fallujah, Black Heart Initiate, and that big drive uh, we all talked about. It. We said, don't drive at night as much as possible. We got two days. You can do it. It's all good. And so then the Faceless proceeded to drive at night. And then they crashed into a herd of uh, deer. I don't even know what they hit and, and just totaled their vehicle in the middle of the night. It's like a dangerous kind of thing to do. You really have to like kind of gauge what the safest time to drive is. And it's just like the most, most important part really is just like get to the show. Don't crash. You know what I mean? So... Uh, it is doable, but uh, it makes it a lot easier when you can just kind of dip into the States and do a couple dates there, and uh, and yeah. And uh, on, on this tour now, you guys are finishing off these Canadian dates. You're going to move into the U.S. Is there a huge difference between the two markets when it comes to Arch Spire? Um, in terms of, I mean, just the history they have with uh, markets like Toronto and Montreal, we just have such a, a long history with with those markets. We have been playing places like New York and, and Boston and that kind of stuff for quite a while. But uh, I don't know, like you feel, even though I'm super far away from home, I still feel at home right now, which is kind of nice. Uh, the, uh, other than that, I mean, everybody's pretty supportive. We <coughs> go to play shows and just, it's cool if a hundred people come out. I don't really, like, it's just, it's, it's still, I mean, I'm sitting here in the bus. The lineup is at, massive. The lineup is so insane. I, uh, it doesn't, I don't know, like seeing that as a, as a guy in a band, I go, oh yeah, well that lineup is there because the support bands are really good and well the marketing was pretty good. For, I, it's just hard to be like, wait, they're here to see my band? <laughs> like makes no sense to me. 
It's pretty cool. I don't know. Go, well, going from that one guy in Edmonton to like a, a crowded house at the yeah. Phoenix, I'm sure. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a, there's a little bit of adjusting to do. But you guys have been doing amazing. You guys have been Thank selling you. out a lot of shows. Uh, so this should become the norm and not and not necessarily uh, <laughs> the exception to the rule. Well, and uh, yeah, with, with records like the le the last one that won a Juno, uh, how is that for you? H has that changed anything for you guys winning that Juno or um, everything still the same? So you're referring to the, the Juno Award, which is basically like uh, the Canadian equivalent of a, of a Grammy of Award. Grammy. Yeah, so in 2021 or 2022, we won the, the best hard album, heavy music album. And we were up against like Spirit Box and Brand of Sacrifice and like insanely awesome bands. Um, I don't know if it changed too much about the band. Uh, we all have a cool little trophy now. And I think our parents take us more seriously. <laughs> they go, whoa, you won a Juno, because that's something that they can kind of, you know, it's one thing to, you know, come see your son play a show and it's at a kind of dingy bar and there's people and you say dumb jokes on stage. But then it's another thing to get sort of what you might consider more mainstream recognition, which is like a Juno winning an actual, like an award that has a televised event attached to it. That's, it's very similar to having your band's name in the newspaper, which every time we have that happen, my mom's like, hey, I got the newspaper, your name's, your picture's in it. Like, it's a very like, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't know, how, I guess not confirming, but, uh, yeah, it's it's good for our parents. <laughs> it's kind of the biggest thing. Last week, Matt from Cretopsy, they were in town and they yeah. won the Juno this year. And oh, good I, for them! Yeah. And, and I asked him where where he had it, and he said, "Oh, it's in my kids' room. Like it's just <laughs> sitting like in a mantle in my kids' room." So, well, where's yours? Mine's in my closet in a box. <laughs> <laughs> That's worse. I don't I don't want to have it out because I I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of intimidating a little bit because you don't because I mean at home when I'm writing riffs I don't want to be sitting there playing riffs coming up with something and then look over and seeing a reminder that there was at least a few dozen people that liked the last album that we put out enough to nominate us for something and then somehow we won an award like it, it's sort of like I don't want that to kind of be there as a reminder like I gotta it makes you think that everything has to live up to the last thing so you should just like write music and just be comfortable with what you like and just put out something that you enjoy rather than trying to live up to something it's like eh so like doesn't really seem like it would motivate me it might just hinder me uh, but it looks cool and it's really heavy um, so I use it as a doorstop sometimes too <laughs> no I don't do that no, no. Uh, you're, you're talking about the, the Juno as being something that would remind you of maybe force you to work towards something what about the fans expectations because when it comes to Arch Spire, the, the, there's a certain level of an expectations when it comes to a new record, when it comes to a song, specifically from the fan base. You guys have set the bar extremely high for yourselves. Th does that have any impact in you at all? I think that, I think that, I, I, I don't want to sound rude, but I feel like sometimes people don't actually know what they want. People often tell, tell us to write faster, write faster, write faster. Like, well, if we go too much faster, it's just going to sound kind of like nothing. You know what I mean? It's like... I can't really keep going in that. So like we just write what we really enjoy. And we, what we pride ourselves on is in the jam spot, we get together three days a week for many months at a time. And uh, we just write stuff that we think sounds awesome. And we oftentimes, you know, we, what we've done in the past, we might do again, is bring in our friends and have them sit in on a jam and be like, what do you think about this part? And it's been really valuable because then you get a little bit of outside expectation and it's the best if they don't play music. Because if they're not musicians, they're just thinking about it in terms of what it actually sounds like. Because us trying to get out of our own way when it comes to how does this riff feel when I'm playing it rather than how does it actually sound and flow with the whole song. Uh, it's kind of hard to get out of your own brain like that because uh, it's also tied together with with your hands and uh, and what you think the riff should sound like and what you think people might like. It's you just write something that you enjoy. So if you leave the jam spot thinking, man, this riff is stuck in my head and it's really cool, that's usually a pretty good sign. And that's kind of like the marker that we use to determine if we're, if we're kind of on the right track. Uh, we also do a lot of revisions, just over and over again. All four, five of us get into a room, and if one person doesn't like it, then we scrap it. So if we have a riff, and everybody, all four people are like, yeah, that's awesome. And one dude's like, listen, I just don't like it. I don't know what to tell you guys. Then we're either going to change it enough so it sounds different enough so that person does like it, or just get rid of it entirely. Uh, so I don't really know if too much outside expectation has affected us that much. We just still do all the same writing that we always have. Um, 
we're just a little bit faster at it now using sort of modern kind of stuff. We have the whole jam space rigged up with microphones so we can record any idea at any time, which is kind of cool. Uh, but we still just kind of write the same way for the most part. Is it challenging? Is it difficult being the guitar player, a guitar player at Artspire? Um, yeah. Well, uh, no. Uh, I, no, I, no, it's not difficult. No, it's like the easiest. No, it's so sick. No, I, it's nothing challenging. No, it's like you can go from doing construction to then this. It's like, well, this is better. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not saying construction's all like on, on a space completely bad. It's just like in terms of like what I'm able to do in my life and how I, my priorities, it's like, well, I'd probably rather go on tour and play guitar. And if I was to complain about this, I would be an idiot. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, like death metal pays my rent. It's like, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen to anybody. So it's pretty amazing to have that happen. So no, it's not hard. It's very, very easy. <laughs> First time I have ever saw you guys play live was at the Velvet Underground in Toronto. Oh yeah, and I was really close to you, and you were, I, I can't remember what song you were playing, but I was mesmerized by your fingers, and I had pulled out my phone. I, I didn't record your face; I just recorded your hands <laughs> playing because I had Creepy. to record it so I could show it to my son at home. Because oh, otherwise, yeah. how can I explain what I just saw? <laughs> I don't think this is even humanly possible to move that quick. Do, do you do you record yourself? Do you look at some of the things that you're doing in order to improve your technique, in order to push yourself even further in terms of of how technically you can get? Uh, I do a lot of recording of myself at home, so. I've, just, I've been doing that for many, many years, probably 10 years or more. And so I just really have gotten used to the sound of my own guitar playing, so much so that I kind of hate it a lot of the time. It's nice to hear somebody else play my riffs or have somebody sitting there and, and I play a riff for them like my wife or something. I can you know, capture her and stick her on a chair somewhere. And it's like, don't move. Like, listen to this thing real quick and just force her to listen to something. And if I can hear it sort of through her, ear, through her ears and hear what she might be hearing, it kind of helps me get a vibe of what it is I'm playing. And oftentimes the things that you don't find that are super important or cool or interesting or whatever are a lot of times the things that people actually really like about it. So you go, yeah, yeah, this part's whatever. And someone goes, no, that's the best part. That's so cool. It's like, oh, okay, all right. Well, I didn't, I, that's why I'm a big fan of collaborative writing. I think collaborative writing is the way to go, especially in death metal. There's so many parts going on. I mean, you can take a riff that's pretty cool, drum, drum part that's really cool, and it sounds great together, but as soon as you add in a bass line that has sort of a movement to it that brings out new characteristics of each of those other instruments, then it's you get something that's greater than some of those parts. It's like a real different kind of thing. So I, I don't know. I mean, like watching myself is also a little bit hard when it comes to live stuff. Like I, uh, I'll watch us play, and the weird thing is that because we play to a click track live, I'm listening to like a perfect mix of of uh, whatever I want in my in-ears on stage, I actually sl you slow, almost slow things down in your head. You think about them in terms of what I call like chunks. So it's a, here's a chunk of a riff and a chunk of a riff, and then you put them together. But when you watch it on video, I go like, whoa, it sounds like we're playing everything like 30 BPM faster. Like what the heck? <laughs> this sounds too, like, it's really weird. It sounds totally different in my head. Uh, plus it's like almost all muscle memory at this point too. So everything that I'm playing, it's just, it, it would be hard for me to not play it. You know, you'd have to like really actively like, okay, stop playing, stop, you know, cause you've just, we've done it so many times, um, but yeah. Even with all that muscle memory, is there are still certain songs that when the, when a tour rolls around and you're looking at the set list, you're like, shit, how do I play that thing again? Yeah. And you spend yeah. like weeks before the tour relearning some of your own stuff. Oh, I'm supposed to practice? <laughs> uh, shit. Uh, yeah, there's a couple parts in so we start off with two songs that are pretty easy for me. The third song has a couple kind of tricky parts, but it's pretty new. Fourth song, pretty easy. Fifth song is also pretty easy. And then when I get to the sixth song, I'm just like, oh, shit. Like, I hope I'm warmed up at that point because the sixth song that we're playing on the set list just has a bunch of things that we wrote mostly in the studio. And I just was really stupid about how I kind of built it. And it's like hard riff after hard riff after hard riff. And I'm like... By the end of it, uh, it's it's the point in the set where everything is easy, easy, kind of tough, and then difficulty spikes like crazy, and then after that point, I can relax. So it really is in the middle of the set I can kind of relax, which is which is nice. Um, yeah, there's always kind of a little bit of regret of putting in a part. Damn, I shouldn't have done that. Or our producer Dave Otero would be like, "You got to do this. This is really cool." It's like, yeah, but then I'm doing sweeping into tapping into sweeping again. How am I going to do this live? And he's kind of 
do your best. <laughs> I don't know. It's not perfect. But. When you assess your own performance on stage, when you look back at how the, the, the show went, uh, do you have certain parameters that you set for yourself in order to say that at the end of the night that this was a good show? I actually kind of like it when I mess up. I think it's kind of, because I think... Do, do it, people notice a lot? Well, the other night I messed up so bad that I, there's no way you couldn't notice. Because I, I was listening to... Uh, it was the beginning, the beginning of our third song, and it's a clean section. And I'm listening to the other guitar. I'm like, man, that sounds really... Oh, my God, I should be playing guitar right now. <laughs> like, in the middle... So, okay, I'll come back in. I know exactly where to come back in. I'm like, okay, I'll play these two notes. Both of those are wrong. Okay, I'll try the next one. Both of those are wrong. I'm just going to wait. <laughs> so if you didn't think that... Like, it sounded so bad. But... I, I don't know, it's like, it, that's more unique than just seeing us play exactly the riff. Mm -hmm. So you might actually see that, see me fucking up a part, and be like, oh, that's uh, that's the mistake. And then the next part, I'm going to really try my hardest to be bang on with all those parts. So I always find that if I mess something up, then I try to make it up by going extra hard for the next part. Because everybody's going to mess stuff up. It doesn't matter. It goes by so quickly, who cares? And, you know, in my head, it probably sounded really bad. But maybe somebody in the back in the room was like, that sounded kind of weird, but whatever. That's it went by pretty quick. Yeah, they so. improvised. They yeah, improvised. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they just yes. they're, they're improvising. They're yeah. improvising. And speaking of improvising, do you do you change anything at all uh, in in order to make the live situation a little bit easier for yourself in certain songs? Do you tweak with certain tracks. There's a couple parts where there's a held out note that goes into another part, and you just can't physically do it. So you'll have to change things up like that. There's also a couple things where, like I really prioritize the, and I don't know how nerdy music theory your, your audience is, but I really prioritize the downbeat of stuff. So if I'm playing something that's crazy fast, and the next riff has a real strong downbeat, sometimes I'll sacrifice the last two or three notes of that riff to make sure I hit that note. Because it'll be a, temp, a, a technique that I need to do something crazy, but I have to prep for the next part. I'll sacrifice those notes just so I can get the dun, so it's really powerful on that note. Because I think that's actually what people notice, notice the most. Um, and honestly, even when you're, when you're playing something super fast and you're like, man, I just don't have time to play these two notes, just sound coming out of your guitar oftentimes kind of masks it. I'll do a little slide here, and yeah, it's, not, it's worked so far. But, yeah. did, did you ever think to yourself that, why did I get in the, into a band that plays all of this super fast technical stuff when I could be playing three chords all the time yeah. and just jumping around like a maniac and really enjoying myself? And I can't do none of that. Well, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not writing that off in my life. I mean, at some point maybe in my life I'll do that. I don't know. I, I do sort of imagine something where I'm like, it would be kind of sick to play music that's like really easy and fun uh this music is really fun because it's very challenging and you have to like really focus on stuff uh but yeah i don't know i mean playing simpler music might be kind of interesting it might be a cool switch maybe the last half of my life i'll do that i don't know well i, I hope not anytime soon because <laughs> yeah. we're, we're enjoying our spire yeah. the way it is so yeah. we need to keep it the way it's going Thanks. uh dean thank you very much for your time today man i really appreciate it all the best with the rest of the tour and you're departing Canada. You're going to be entering the U.S. for a very long run until you get to the West Coast. Yeah. So thank you very much for your time tonight. It was an absolute pleasure. Oh, thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me.